What does Joel Osteen, Nolan Ryan, and Jacob from Genesis have to do with each other? To find out, stay tuned for Reach Out and Live. Welcome to Reach Out and Live, a program of music, scripture, and sermon, brought to you each week by the many viewers and members of First Plymouth Church, Lincoln, Nebraska. Hi, my name's Jim, minister here at First Plymouth. Now, we're looking at the greatest wrestling match of all time in Genesis 32. The Plymouth Choir is ready and the congregation is gathered. Let's join them. Let us hear this word from the book of Genesis, chapter 32. It is a continuation of the story of Jacob and Esau, and here we have Jacob in an encounter. The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please, Tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed them. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. By any measure, you could call Joel Osteen America's preacher. Every Sunday, 45,000 people flow into his church. Every Sunday, another 10 million watch on television. Many more millions download his sermons online. He has written numerous Number one New York Times bestseller books, America's Preacher. But like any preacher, you might groove on what he has to say or not so much. Everybody has their own opinion. There is something I really like. When he, when he has his congregation repeat after him, he'll have them hold their Bible and repeat after him, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Oh, I like that. 
Joel Osteen is often trying to call us to our purpose and our potential. In Scripture, we learn that we are made in the image of God. We learn that we have been set free. For freedom's sake, we have been set free. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. We have been set free and set right. Set right with our brothers and sisters. Set right with God. We call call this being saved. In Scripture, Jesus tells us that you will do greater things than He. So, let's listen to Scripture. Let's do it right now. This is our Bible. Repeat after me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Let's stay near Houston for a few more moments. A little bit outside Houston is a small town named Alvin. And there lives the greatest fireballer in Major League Baseball history. Many of you might not remember the name Nolan Ryan anymore. But Nolan Ryan set the record for Major League strikeouts, 5,714 strikeouts. The next person on that list in the long storied history of baseball, the next person on that list is more than a thousand strikeouts behind him. This year, the guy that led the Major League in strikeouts had 257 strikeouts. He would have to lead the majors for the next 22 years straight to hit Nolan Ryan. That strikeout record will likely never be broken. Nolan Ryan was the greatest fireballer in history. He had the most no-hits, no-hit games. He had the most one-hit games. He had the most two-hit games. He had the most three-hit games in Major League history. When he was on, he was virtually unhittable. Greatest fireballer in history. Now, when he first began, the radar machine was not as good at clocking speeds accurately. They believed that when he first started, he was throwing the baseball 108 miles per hour. The batters said you could hear the ball sizzle as it went by you, and it would hit the catcher's mitt like a firecracker, pop. greatest fireballer in history, perhaps not the greatest pitcher ever. Nolan Ryan threw the most walks in Major League history. He gave up the most grand slams in Major League history. His ERA, eh, but he was a fireballer. Now this week, oddly enough, Nolan Ryan and Jacob of Genesis merged in my mind. You see, on the day this week that I read the Scriptures, Genesis 32, I also watched the new documentary on Netflix about Nolan Ryan. And what I suddenly realized was that for both men, it was a wrestling match that culminated their career. It was a wrestling match that sort of redefined them. You may not remember this about Nolan Ryan, but when he was 46 years old, he was still throwing the baseball almost 100 miles an hour. That is unfathomable. In one of his last games pitching for the Texas Rangers, he was going up against the White Sox Now, the White Sox had decided if he hit one of their batters, they were going to charge the mound because Nolan Ryan was known for throwing at batters if they looked too comfortable at the plate. 46 years old. 
he lets one of his 100-mile purr loose, hits Robin Ventura right in the side. Robin Ventura was 26 years old. He threw down his bat and he began to charge the mound. 26-year-old running full tilt at the 46-year-old. And Nolan Ryan is just standing there waiting for him. When the 26-year-old got there, he lunged in at him low. And in one deft move, Nolan Ryan put him in a headlock and started giving him the business. <laughs> and then they fell to the ground and both teams fell upon them. Nolan Ryan said that under that mass of humanity, he, he couldn't even breathe. He wasn't sure he'd get out of there. And then one big arm came in and pulled him loose. It was Bo Jackson. Do you remember Bo Jackson, the great two sports star on the White Sox? Well, this last fight that Nolan Ryan had became iconic in Texas. The, the middle-aged man getting the best of a young man, every middle-aged man in Texas suddenly felt better about themselves. It ensured his hero status. It culminated his career. Jacob was 97 years old when he had that wrestling match that's in your bulletin. And it was that wrestling match at an advanced age that culminated his career, that redefined who he was. Let me give you some of Jacob's career stats. Remember with me that his was a life of ups and downs. He, he could reach the heights of spiritual vision, but he was sort of morally ambiguous and and. He was a bit of a ne'er-do-well, really. Ups and downs. Let me remind you that Jacob and Esau were twins in the womb of Rebekah. Remember that Scripture tells us they were wrestling in the womb, even. That's foreshadowing in the Bible. They're wrestling already. Esau is born first. He comes out of the womb first. This is critical. That means he'll get the inheritance, the blessing. But Jacob is holding on to his foot as they come out of the womb. Rebecca could have used an epidural at this point. <laughs> Esau is born first. Remember that Jacob and Esau are two very different people as brothers. Esau is an outdoorsman, a hunter. Jacob is more of a stay-at-home intellectual type. Remember that after they grew up, Esau came back from hunting one day, and his brother Jacob had some stew, and Esau was so hungry, but Jacob took advantage of his brother in his hour of need and cut a deal with him to get his inheritance for a pot of stew. This made Jacob livid, I mean Esau livid, of course. Remember that later, um, Jacob steals his blessing again when Isaac is super old. He can't really see. He can't really hear. And Jacob takes advantage of this elderly father and pretend that he was Esau. Do you remember this? To get that blessing. This would be like elder abuse. You'd be like imprisoned for this these days if, if you robbed an elderly person that had lost their faculties. But that's what he does to his father. Now Esau wants to kill him. So Jacob runs off to Haran to be with his uncle Laban, and as Jacob gets there, he sees Rachel standing by a well, and he immediately falls in love. It was sort of a creepy male gaze, but this is old school storytelling, right? And, and he cuts a deal then with Laban to work for Laban for seven years so he can have Rachel in marriage. He works seven years, but then Laban tricks him, gives him his other daughter. Now he's got to work another seven years to get Rachel. You see, he has two wives when he comes to the river Jabbok in your text. Two wives, 11 kids, a couple handmaidens, a lot going on there. Now, on his way to Haran, Jacob had had a spiritual vision of the ladder of angels descending and ascending, Jacob's ladder. But again, when he gets there, he becomes morally ambiguous again. And then finally, after 14 years, when he's ready to leave with his wives, 
they sort of steal Laban's cattle and flock. They sort of steal that, they head off, and that led to the original WTF. Laban says, what the flock? And he starts chasing them. So now, now Jacob is on the run from Esau who wants to kill him with 400 person army, and, and, and Laban who's mad at him. He's on the run. He's lost the sense of who he really is. He hasn't gotten his life together at all. He lands at the river Jobbik. He sends his family ahead, and there we are. Those are his career stats, but this wrestling match now will finally culminate his life. He'll finally understand his purpose, who he can really be. Now, this wrestling match all through Christian history has led to many different interpretations. Who's he wrestling? In the tradition, it's unclear whether is he wrestling a man or an angel or God Himself. The tradition hears it in all three ways. Even at the end of the passage, it says that he saw God face to face, but it said he was wrestling a man. Is that an angel or a man or God? Then his name is changed to Israel, which means to wrestle with God. But now he has his identity. In ancient Christian history, one common interpretation was that Jacob was wrestling himself. That what we have here is a picturesque description of an internal struggle. We do wrestle with ourselves a lot a lot. Oh, you probably wrestle with yourself about whether you're good enough. You probably have these thoughts you wrestle with that somehow you haven't measured up, or somehow mm, in some way you're not who you were meant to be. There's something inadequate about you, and you're wrestling with that sense. Well, I want to tell you today that you have a superpower. In that wrestling match with yourself, you have a superpower, and I want to tell you about it. You see, my friends, you are a sentient being. You have consciousness. You can think. You have thoughts. This is amazing that you're a consciousness, that you can have thoughts, but that's not your superpower. What is amazing even more is that you have self-reflective consciousness. You can think about your thoughts. Oh, this is a superpower. You, you don't just think. You can then sort of stand aside and take measure of your own thoughts. You can analyze your own thoughts. This is a superpower, really. Self-reflective consciousness. It might be that only humans have those. We know animals have thoughts. They have consciousness, but it might not be self-reflective. Like, take a cat, man. A cat will just follow its own thoughts. It'll do what it wants. But we have self-reflective. We can think about our thoughts and then make another decision. The great philosopher Schopenhauer said, This is extraordinary that the subject could become an object of itself. That's a massive contradiction. How could it be? It's our superpower. So you could realize that you're not your thoughts. You can actually stand aside from your thoughts and take their measure, analyze them, decide if they're worthy. This is a superpower. You are not your thoughts. And so when you're wrestling with yourself, Don't forget this superpower. Oh, you can analyze the way you think. So, for example, one tendency we have is that we're looking at others around us all the time and we're sort of comparing ourselves to them. But what we will tend to do is compare the worst of ourselves with the best of them. That's not not being fair to ourselves. 
But if we're struggling with something, we'll look around and it looks like everyone else just has it all together. You'll look at others and they'll look like they're so much more confident. And man, they've got their life together. Oh, this is an illusion. Everybody's mostly walking around like they look like they have it together. That's what we learn to do. But we'll imagine this inadequacy. They don't have it. That's not a fair comparison. Trust me, they're wrestling too. And we'll watch each other so closely, and we'll imagine that other people are taking our measure all the time, and they're thinking about us a lot and judging us. We begin to see ourselves through their eyes. You wouldn't worry so much what others thought of you if you knew how little they did, right? They're just not sitting around thinking about your life all the time. And my friends, even if they are, their thoughts about your life does not have a burning intensity. It's not their life. They might have some thoughts about you, but it doesn't have that fiery, grinding kind of feeling you have. So, use your superpower. You can take the measure of your own thoughts. Oh, one thing we'll do. Oh, we just naturally try to evade responsibility, and we don't want too much asked of ourselves, so we'll actually begin to denigrate our abilities to avoid having to do anything. Well, we're just natural. Well, we just want to kind of… So, you'll kind of beat yourself, oh, I can't do that, or oh, I couldn't be a help over there, or I'm not able to do things like that. You could look at your thoughts and wonder, am I just thinking that way because it allows me not to have to do anything? Oh, you can analyze your thoughts. You could say for the most of the time, you, you, you could say most of the time, whatever you're thinking about yourself, that you really, really, you're not as good as you think or as bad as you think, right? We, but you'll go to extremes. You'll have moments of elation or you'll have moments of desperation, and you imagine those extremes are real. They're not. You can take the measure of your own thoughts. It's a superpower. So when your wrestling match, we all have a wrestling match going. In your wrestling match, remember these things again. This is our Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do.
it is wonderful that we could worship together. I hope it has brought you strength. Do you know you could join this worship service live every Sunday morning at 9 or 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, or our website. And all of that is made possible by donations from people like you. If you believe that an open-minded, loving congregation can help change the world, then consider making a donation. It will help us increase the love of God and neighbor, both in Nebraska and the world. If you would like to learn more about our church, go to firstplymouth.org. You can watch videos of the sermons, learn about our many programs and missions, then follow us to Facebook and become a friend. We now worship online at 9 a.m. and 10.30 on YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, and our website. We also add live events, so join us online. And so you have a superpower. You can reflect about your own thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You can decide what are the good thoughts, what will I act upon, and then you can reach out and live. Tune in again next week for another edition of Reach Out and Live. Thank you.